a presidential address to Congress. Live from Washington, here is Brian Williams. It's actually thunder and lightning on Capitol Hill as we've been in the grips here in Washington of some awful weather. Of course, that forms part of the backdrop for tonight's speech by President Obama to a joint session of Congress. With our politics in such rough shape these days, as you may know, there was actually a fight over uh, when and where this speech would be delivered and scheduling it, and they have arrived at this compromise hard against tonight's uh, NFL game game, of course, but uh, most members of the House and Senate are in the chamber tonight. And uh, while the speech is about the economy and jobs, and while we're fresh from covering the GOP debate last night in California, here we are days away from the 10th anniversary of 9-11. Uh, in really a new country in terms of homeland security, just the use of that phrase, say nothing of the cabinet level department, uh, the new reality we all got used to after that awful day in 2001, and it has uh, reared its head again. Um, just as we were going off the air for NBC Nightly News tonight, and as we come on the air for this special tonight, there is a homeland security issue that has arisen um, big enough to get the attention of the president. He's been briefed on it. Our justice correspondent, Pete Williams, has been reporting on this. He's with us as part of our coverage tonight. Pete, uh, what do we know about this and what best to call it? Well, I think best to call it unconfirmed. It's a specific piece of intelligence information that the United States has picked up within the last several hours, specific enough that it got their attention. It rose above the normal level of the usual kind of chatter that they hear running up to events like this. It's something they've been discussing for the past several hours. They consider it specific, but it's unconfirmed. There are questions that are internally contradictory in it. And in a statement just out, the Department of Homeland Security describes it as a specific and credible but unconfirmed mm. and they also say in this statement that oftentimes these things come along and then uh, as they do further checking they wash out so there's a note of uh, I guess some skepticism even in the statement from the government itself what they're probably going to do is take this information pass it along to local law enforcement that's been their pattern for the past several days you know anything that they get they're basically passing along at this point but it doesn't sound at least at this point that they've decided to use the new terror or threat system that has just been uh, set up by the Department of Homeland Security. If they did do that, by the way, Brian, it would be different than the old color-coded days. They'd be very specific, and they'd tell us what we're supposed to do. And can't you almost hear folks at home, perhaps folks who aren't that interested in the speech but are waiting for the game, uh, asking that question that we're now used to after 10 years of this, what am I supposed to do? How is this supposed to change the way I act? And of course, there's a lot more we need to learn about this. Right. I, we do know it's directed, the, the threat is directed against New York and Washington, but specifically beyond that, what we don't know yet. And we may never know. I mean, these things come up. There was one before the inauguration of President Obama that had everybody in town very concerned, and ultimately nothing came of that either. So they're, they're really scrubbing this tonight and trying to figure out what to do with it. And of course, as you know, we found reference and kind of uh, aspirational plans when they raided the bin Laden uh, uh, compound uh, looking at this next big anniversary and things he had on his mind but no evidence it was more than that and that is the frame through which all this is being viewed because of the fact that Obama expressed some desire to have some kind of an attack around iconic events like this 9-11 anniversary that's what got everybody's antenna up in the first place all right the president uh, we're on a standby here for the president to enter the chamber um, and uh, Chuck Todd is standing by at the White House tonight. Uh, Chuck, what can you add to this discussion before we turn the corner into the uh, reason and purpose for the speech tonight? Well, Brian, look, what I've been told is simply, yes, the president uh, has been briefed. You've got John Brennan, who's dealing with this, but that all statements and all uh, public uh, alerts are going to come through uh, the Department of Homeland Security and and uh, right on clockwork there was some discussion would it would it be issued after the speech none of that and it's all in the hands of DHS at this point Brian all right and Chuck as we await the president entering uh, the chamber we should probably uh, turn into the topic in chief tonight yes. and that is with our politics so badly broken and having heard from the GOP in terms of their debate last night Here's the backdrop as the gavel comes down and uh, 
the President of the United States. Mr. Levengood announces the Chief Executive. So, Chuck, talk to us about uh, the president's motivation, uh, what he, uh, broad strokes, what he plans to say, what he hopes to get out of this. Well, look, the White House knows this is a now or never moment. They're in about a two and a half month window, as one administration official sort of reluctantly admitted, where they can still govern, they believe. And so the motivation of this speech, uh, the proposal he's going to send to Congress next week, he already called Speaker Boehner, Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell, to inform them he's sending the American Jobs Act everything that he'll be outlining tonight, putting it in bill form, sending it to Congress next week. But the purpose of this speech is to essentially raise the level of awareness of the American public that A, he's trying to do this, that B, forces the Republicans either to be with him on this, willing to work with him, or to try to publicly show that they won't work with him and essentially run against Congress. And then suddenly, instead of this being a job speech and an agenda fall, it turns quickly into the start of the re-election campaign. Uh, moderating Read the Press, uh, David Gregory is watching here in the studio uh, along with us. David, first of all, a lesson in just how manhandled presidents get coming down that aisle. Everyone wants their face time, hand time, camera time with the president. But second, uh, since you've, you've covered the White House, among other things, think of the, the burdens of office. This president, his predecessor, any president, think of what he's just been briefed on. He now has to pivot. He now has to talk about the economy. The stakes just couldn't be higher. Well, they're huge, and, and Pete's reporting under only underlines what we spent uh, the last decade dealing with and reporting on, which was the reality that the country faces, that there are the potential for additional attacks, and the question of vigilance. Against this backdrop, where the country is perhaps facing a double-dip recession, people are not spending, people are saving instead. The housing market is still failing, uh, and you have a financial crisis now in Europe that mirrors what we faced in the United States. This is a big leadership moment now. The president is essentially saying, Government can do something here and must do something to try to instill some confidence, to assert leadership. That's what Americans are angry about because they think it's just missing. The president has told friends, as we just saw him shaking the, uh, the hands of his vice president and Speaker John Boehner, that uh, his relationship with um, the uh, Speaker of the House is, uh, is quite good. Uh, it's some of the other members uh, uh, that he's... Uh, had trouble with, of course, uh, as well, well documented recently uh, during the um, uh, debt ceiling fight that we just went through. Um, again, tonight we'll have a little bit of a different feel. It'll be a, a shorter speech than most we've seen to uh, joint session of Congress, where it looks like we're going to get it underway about 10 minutes after the hour. Members of Congress, yes. I have the high privilege and the distinct honor of presenting to you the President of the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Everyone, please have a seat. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Vice President, members of Congress, and fellow Americans. Tonight, we meet at an urgent time for our country. We continue to face an economic crisis that has left millions of our neighbors jobless, and a political crisis that's made things worse. This past week, reporters have been asking, what will this speech mean for the President? What will it mean for Congress? How will it affect their polls and the next election? But the millions of Americans who are watching right now, they don't care about politics. They have real life concerns. They need to spend months looking for work. Others are doing their best just to scrape by 
giving up nights out with the family to save on gas or make the mortgage, postponing retirement to send a kid to college. These men and women grew up with faith in an America where hard work and responsibility paid off. They believed in a country where everyone gets a fair shake and does their fair share. Where if you stepped up, did your job, and were loyal to your company, that loyalty would be rewarded with a decent salary and good benefits. Maybe a raise once in a while. If you did the right thing, you could make it. Anybody could make it in America. And for decades now, Americans have watched that compact erode. They have seen the decks too often stacked against them. And they know that Washington has not always put their interests first. The people of this country work hard to meet their responsibilities. The question tonight is whether we'll meet ours. The question is whether, in the face of an ongoing national crisis, we can stop the political circus and actually do something to help the economy. The question, the question is whether we can restore some of the fairness and security that has defined this nation since our beginning. Those of us here tonight can't solve all our nation's woes. Ultimately, our recovery will be driven not by Washington, but by our businesses and our workers. But we can help. We can make a difference. There are steps we can take right now to improve people's lives. I am sending this Congress a plan that you should pass right away. It's called the American Jobs Act. There should be nothing controversial about this piece of legislation. Everything in here is the kind of proposal that's been supported by both Democrats and Republicans, including many who sit here tonight. And everything in this bill will be paid for, everything. The purpose of the American Jobs Act is simple, to put more people back to work and more money in the pockets of those who are working. It will create more jobs for construction workers, more jobs for teachers, more jobs for veterans, and more jobs for long-term unemployed. It will, provide, it will provide a tax break for companies who hire new workers, and it will cut payroll taxes in half for every working American and every small business. It will provide a jolt to an economy that has stalled and give companies confidence that if they invest and if they hire, there will be customers for their products and services. You should pass this jobs plan right away. Everyone here knows that small businesses are where most new jobs begin. And you know that while corporate profits have come roaring back, Smaller companies have it. So for everyone who speaks so passionately about making life easier for job creators, this plan's for you. Pass this jobs bill. Pass this jobs bill, and starting tomorrow, small businesses will get a tax cut if they hire new workers or if they raise workers' wages. Pass this jobs bill, and all small business owners will also see their payroll taxes cut in half next year. If you have 50 employees, if you have 50 employees making an average salary, that's an $80,000 tax cut. And all businesses will be able to continue writing off the investments they make in 2012. It's not just Democrats who have supported this kind of proposal. 50 House Republicans have proposed the same payroll tax cut that's in this plan. You should pass it right away. Pass this jobs bill and we can put people to work rebuilding America. 
Everyone here knows we have badly decaying roads and bridges all over the country. Our highways are clogged with traffic. Our skies are the most congested in the world. It's an outrage. Building a world-class transportation system is part of what made us an economic superpower. And now we're going to sit back and watch China build newer airports and faster railroads at a time when millions of unemployed construction workers could build them right here in America? private construction companies all across America just waiting to get to work. There's a bridge that needs repair between Ohio and Kentucky that's on one of the busiest trucking routes in North America. A public transit project in Houston that will help clear up one of the worst areas of traffic in the country. And there are schools throughout this country that desperately need renovating. How can we expect our kids to do their best in places that are literally falling apart. This is America. Every child deserves a great school, and we can give it to them if we act now. The American Jobs Act will repair and modernize at least 35,000 schools. It will put people to work right now, fixing roofs and windows, installing science labs and high-speed internet and classrooms all across this country. It will rehabilitate homes and businesses and communities hit hardest by foreclosures. It will jumpstart thousands of transportation projects all across the country. And to make sure the money is properly spent, we're building on reforms we've already put in place. No more earmarks. No more boondoggles. No more bridges to nowhere. We're cutting the red tape that prevents some of these projects from getting started as quickly as possible. And we'll set up an independent fund to attract private dollars and issue loans based on two criteria, how badly a construction project is needed and how much good it will do for the economy. This idea came from a bill written by a Texas Republican and a Massachusetts Democrat. The idea for a big boost in construction is supported by America's largest business organization and America's largest labor organization. It's the kind of proposal that's been supported in the past by Democrats and Republicans alike. You should pass it right away. Pass this jobs bill, and thousands of teachers in every state will go back to work. These are the men and women charged with preparing our children for a world where the competition has never been tougher. But while they're adding teachers in places like South Korea, we're laying them off in droves. It's unfair to our kids. It undermines their future and ours, and it has to stop pass this bill and put our teachers back in the classroom where they belong. Pass this jobs bill and companies will get extra tax credits if they hire America's veterans. We ask these men and women to leave their careers, leave their families, risk their lives to fight for our country. The last thing they should have to do is fight for a job when they come home. Pass this bill, and hundreds of thousands of disadvantaged young people will have the hope and the dignity of a summer job next year. And their parents, their parents, low-income Americans who desperately want to work, will have more ladders out of poverty. 
pass this jobs bill and companies will get a $4,000 tax credit if they hire anyone who has spent more than six months looking for a job. We, we have to do more to help the long-term unemployed in their search for work. This jobs plan builds on a program in Georgia that several Republican leaders have highlighted, where people who collect unemployment insurance participate in temporary work as a way to build their skills while they look for a permanent job. The plan also extends unemployment insurance for another year. If the millions of unemployed Americans stop getting this insurance and stop using that money for basic necessities, it would be a devastating blow to this economy. Democrats and Republicans in this chamber have supported unemployment insurance plenty of times in the past, and in this time of prolonged hardship, you should pass it again, right away. <laughs> pass this jobs bill, and the typical working family will get a $1,500 tax cut next year. $1,500 that would have been taken out of your pocket will go into your pocket. This expands on the tax cut the Democrats and Republicans already passed for this year. If we allow that tax cut to expire, if we refuse to act, middle-class families will get hit with a tax increase at the worst possible time. We can't let that happen. I know that some of you have sworn oaths to never raise any taxes on anyone for as long as you live. Now is not the time to carve out an exception and raise middle-class taxes, which is why you should pass this bill right away. This is the American Jobs Act. It'll lead to new jobs for construction workers, for teachers, for veterans, for first responders, young people, and the long-term unemployed. It'll provide tax credits to companies that hire new workers, tax relief to small business owners, and tax cuts for the middle class. And here's the other thing I want the American people to know. The American Jobs Act will not add to the deficit. It will be paid for. And here's how. The agreement we passed in July will cut government spending by about a trillion dollars over the next 10 years. It also charges this Congress to come up with an additional $1.5 trillion in savings by Christmas. Tonight, I am asking you to increase that amount so that it covers the full cost of the American Jobs Act. And a week from Monday, I'll be releasing a more ambitious deficit plan, a plan that will not only cover the cost of this jobs bill, but stabilize our debt in the long run. This approach is basically the one I've been advocating for months. In addition to the trillion dollars of spending cuts I've already signed into law, it's a balanced plan that would reduce the deficit by making additional spending cuts, by making modest adjustments to health care programs like Medicare and Medicaid, and by reforming our tax code in a way that asks the wealthiest Americans and biggest corporations to pay their fair share. What's more, the spending cuts wouldn't happen so abruptly that they'd be a drag on our economy or prevent us from helping small businesses and middle-class families get back on their feet right away. Now, I realize there are some in my party who don't think we should make any changes at all to Medicare and Medicaid, and I understand their concerns. But here's the truth. Millions of Americans rely on Medicare in their retirement, and millions more will do so in the future. They pay for this benefit during their working years. They earn it. But with an aging population and rising health care costs, we are spending too fast to sustain the program. And if we don't gradually reform the system while protecting current beneficiaries, it won't be there when future retirees need it. We have to reform Medicare to strengthen it. I am also... I'm also well aware that there are many Republicans who don't believe we should raise taxes on those who are most fortunate and can best afford it. 
But here's what every American knows. While most people in this country struggle to make ends meet, a few of the most affluent citizens and most profitable corporations enjoy tax breaks and loopholes that nobody else gets. Right now, Warren Buffett pays a lower tax rate than his secretary, an outrage he has asked us to fix. We need a tax code where everyone gets a fair shake and where everybody pays their fair share. And by the way, I believe the vast majority of wealthy Americans and CEOs are willing to do just that if it helps the economy grow and gets our fiscal house in order. I'll also offer ideas to reform a corporate tax code that stands as a monument to special interest influence in Washington. By eliminating pages of loopholes and deductions, we can lower one of the highest corporate tax rates in the world. Our tax code should not give an advantage to companies that can afford the best connected lobbyists. It should give an advantage to companies that invest and create jobs right here in the United States of America. So we can reduce this deficit, pay down our debt, and pay for this job plan in the process. But in order to do this, we have to decide what our priorities are. We have to ask ourselves, what's the best way to grow the economy and create jobs? Should we keep tax loopholes for oil companies? Or should we use that money to give small business owners a tax credit when they hire new workers? Because we can't afford to do both. Should we keep tax breaks for millionaires and billionaires? Or should we put teachers back to work so our kids can graduate ready for college and good jobs. Right now, we can't afford to do both. This isn't political grandstanding. This isn't class warfare. This is simple math. This is simple math. These are real choices. These are real choices that we've got to make. And I'm pretty sure I know what most Americans would choose. It's not even close. And it's time for us to do what's right for our future. Now, the American Jobs Act answers the urgent need to create jobs right away. But we can't stop there. As I've argued since I ran for this office, we have to look beyond the immediate crisis and start building an economy that lasts into the future. An economy that creates good, middle-class jobs that pay well and offer security. We now live in a world where technology has made it possible for companies to take their business anywhere. If we want them to start here and stay here and hire here, we have to be able to outbuild and out-educate and out-innovate every other country on Earth. And this task of making America more competitive for the long haul, that's a job for all of us, for government and for private companies, for states and for local communities, and for every American citizen. All of us will have to up our game. All of us will have to change the way we do business. My administration can and will take some steps to improve our competitiveness on our own. For example, if you're a small business owner who has a contract with the federal government, we're going to make sure you get paid a lot faster than you do right now. We're also planning to cut away the red tape that prevents too many rapidly growing startup companies from raising capital and going public. And to help responsible homeowners, we're going to work with federal housing agencies to help more people refinance their mortgages at interest rates that are now near 4%. That's a step. I 
I know you guys must be for this, because that's a step that can put more than $2,000 a year in a family's pocket and give a lift to an economy still burdened by the drop in housing prices. So some things we can do on our own. Other steps will require congressional action. Today, you passed reform that will speed up the outdated patent process so that entrepreneurs can turn a new idea into a new business as quickly as possible. That's the kind of action we need. Now it's time to clear the way for a series of trade agreements that would make it easier for American companies to sell their products in Panama and Colombia and South Korea, while also helping the workers whose jobs have been affected by global competition. If Americans can buy Kias and Hyundais, I want to see folks in South Korea driving Fords and Chevys and Chryslers. I want to see more products sold around the world stamped with the three proud words, Made in America. That's what we need to get done. And on all of our efforts to strengthen competitiveness, we need to look for ways to work side by side with America's businesses. That's why I brought together a jobs council of leaders from different industries who are developing a wide range of new ideas to help companies grow and create jobs. Already we've mobilized business leaders to train 10,000 American engineers a year by providing company internships and training. Other businesses are covering tuition for workers who learn new skills at community colleges. And we're going to make sure the next generation of manufacturing takes root not in China or Europe, but right here in the United States of America. If we provide the right incentives, the right support, and if we make sure our trading partners play by the rules, we can be the ones to build everything from fuel-efficient cars to advanced biofuels to semiconductors that we sell all around the world. That's how America can be number one again. And that's how America will be number one again. Now, I realize that some of you have a different theory on how to grow the economy. Some of you sincerely believe that the only solution to our economic challenges is to simply cut most government spending and eliminate most government regulations. And, well, now, I agree that we can't afford wasteful spending. And I'll work with you, with Congress, to root it out. And I agree that there are some rules and regulations that do put an unnecessary burden on businesses at a time when they can least afford it. That's why I ordered a review of all government regulations. So far, we've identified over 500 reforms, which will save billions of dollars over the next few years. We should have no more regulation than the health, safety, and security of the American people Required. Every rule should meet that common sense test. But what we can't do, what I will not do, is let this economic crisis be used as an excuse to wipe out the basic protections that Americans have counted on for decades. I reject the idea that we need to ask people to choose between their jobs and their safety. I reject the argument that says for the economy to grow, we have to roll back protections that ban hidden fees by credit card companies, or rules that keep our kids from being exposed to mercury, or laws that prevent the health insurance industry from shortchanging patients. I reject the idea that we have to strip away collective bargaining rights to compete in a global economy.
We shouldn't be in a race to the bottom where we try to offer the cheapest labor and the worst pollution standards. America should be in a race to the top, and I believe we can win that race. In fact, this larger notion that the only thing we can do to restore prosperity is just dismantle government, refund everybody's money, and let everyone write their own rules and tell everyone they're on their own, that's not who we are. It's not the story of America. Yes, we are rugged individualists. Yes, we are strong and self-reliant. And it has been the drive and initiative of our workers and entrepreneurs that has made this economy the engine and the envy of the world. But there's always been another thread running throughout our history, a belief that we're all connected, and that there's some things we can only do together as a nation. We all remember Abraham Lincoln as the leader who saved our union, founder of the Republican Party. But in the middle of a civil war, he was also a leader who looked to the future, a Republican president who mobilized government to build the Transcontinental Railroad, launched the National Academy of Sciences, set up the first land-grant colleges. And leaders of both parties have followed the example he set. Ask yourselves, where would we be right now if the people who sat here before us decided not to build our highways, not to build our bridges, our dams, our airports? What would this country be like if we had chosen not to spend money on public high schools or research universities or community colleges? Millions of returning heroes, including my grandfather, had the opportunity to go to school because of the GI Bill. Where would we be if they hadn't had that chance? How many jobs would it have cost us? If past Congress has decided not to support the basic research that led to the internet and the computer chip, what kind of country would this be? If this chamber had voted down Social Security or Medicare just because it violated some rigid idea about what government could or could not do, how many Americans would have suffered as a result? No single individual built America on their own. We built it together. We have been and always will be one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all, a nation with responsibilities to ourselves and with responsibilities to one another. And members of Congress, it is time for us to meet our responsibilities. Every proposal I've laid out tonight is the kind that's been supported by Democrats and Republicans in the past. Every proposal I've laid out tonight will be paid for. And every proposal is designed to meet the urgent needs of our people and our communities. Now, I know there's been a lot of skepticism about whether the politics of the moment will allow us to pass this jobs plan or any jobs plan. Already we're seeing the same old press releases and tweets flying back and forth. Already the media has proclaimed that it's impossible to bridge our differences. And maybe some of you have decided that those differences are so great that we can only resolve them at the ballot box. But know this, the next election is 14 months away. And the people who sent us here, the people who hired us to work for them, they don't have the luxury of waiting 14 months. Some of them are living week to week, paycheck to paycheck, even day to day. They need help, and they need it now. 
I don't pretend that this plan will solve all our problems. It should not be, nor will it be, the last plan of action we propose. What's guided us from the start of this crisis hasn't been the search for a silver bullet. It's been a commitment to stay at it, to be persistent, to keep trying every new idea that works, and listen to every good proposal, no matter which party comes up with it. Regardless of the arguments we've had in the past, regardless of the arguments we will have in the future, this plan is the right thing to do right now. You should pass it. And I intend to take that message to every corner of this country. And I ask, I ask every American who agrees to lift your voice. Tell the people who are gathered here tonight that you want action now. Tell Washington that doing nothing is not an option. Remind us that if we act as one nation and one people, we have it within our power to meet this challenge. Now, President Kennedy once said, our problems are man-made. Therefore, they can be solved by man. And man can be as big as he wants. These are difficult years for our country, but we are Americans. We are tougher than the times we live in, and we are bigger than our politics have been. So let's meet the moment, let's get to work, and let's show the world once again why the United States of America remains the greatest nation on Earth. Thank you very much. God bless you. And God bless the United States of America. A speech that was at times a uh, stem winder inside the uh, House chamber tonight. Uh, the reaction, of course, varying from party to party. Uh, we now have something called the American Jobs Act. The president coming back at Congress after that toxic and terrible fight we saw over the debt limit. Uh, the summer recess is over. They are back to work. In fact, the Senate's going back in to work tonight. Uh, Kelly O'Donnell has uh, spent the past hour inside the chamber watching the speech from there. Kelly, the one thing you can't know being in there that we saw from the outside is, even as the president was wrapping up, just a tremendous lightning show over the dome and over Washington tonight, almost a flash a minute during the address. But what it sounded like, and you're there and, and we can't be, 